Today, if you're a B2B SaaS startup and you need to set up a security program from the ground up so you can get through security diligence questionnaires and get your sales going, this chat's for you. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us here. Uh, again, what we're gonna talk about here is how do you set up security programs within your own company? So as we're going through this, I will spend a minute just to give you a little bit of the high level for this. The reason I find this is important is I think a lot of security comes in, they take a bottom-up approach and they're pitching compliance and security, why do you do all these little things? We're gonna come at this from a completely different angle, which is, you know, we're just gonna start at revenue and getting money and how you sell this within the organization, because if you don't have that buy-in from everyone, nothing you're gonna do is gonna really happen. Uh, so really quickly on me, just a quick background on this. Uh, I worked as a CTO, as a CISO, as, as an engineer, run my own business. Uh, I've been, we've been in like MarTech, I've been on banks and FinTech, both sides of this. So I've just been around in a lot of different areas and so have a lot of the people from our company. I think what's helpful from that is we know what everybody is looking for from all the different sides. So whether it be like the auditors, the banks, the fintechs, the smart, the startups, the people that you're selling to, and we're trying to provide that really simplified perspective for it. Uh, right now, just quickly, what we do as a company is ScalePoint. We're a boutique shop. What we actually do is help companies get investment ready for private equity, for fundraising through VC, through family offices, for IPOs, for M&As. Um, and re the reason we come in from this angle is what they're gonna talk about most is revenue. And revenue is the biggest driver for this because what happens when your sales cycles are slowed down by security? And that's a very interesting angle and that's the angle that we're gonna start talking about this from because when you can't sell your product because of security, then like you, and revenue is impaired, now your CEO cares. And then that's a really good reason to drive security and put it within the organization. Um, so really just is one quick background story just to like kind of like color this a little bit. Uh, so why do I care about this? I, I call it like a bit of a love hate for it. Uh, mostly hate, but like with some love in there. So one of the companies we're working at before, they brought in a whole new C-suite. We were doing 30 million revenue, losing 20 million a year, and our VCs cut us off. They said, you need to be profitable, and we've got about six months of runway to do that. We're doing 10 million net new sales a year on like a 20K ACV. So I'm throwing a lot of numbers here, but basically we're getting about 20 security diligence questionnaires, these 150 line things that every time you sell to Oracle, Dell, a bank, insurance company, all those sort of things, if you can't do this, you're not closing your sale. It's taking us one to six months to like get through the security um, diligence phase of every sale that we're doing. So any numbers that we wanna hit from a sales side are just not gonna happen. We got that down to a couple days. At the same time, while we're leaning out the company and not hiring people, we actually had to get rid of a lot of people. But we're able to go from one to six months to two to three days to get this done as an SLA. So why do we find this is really important is like, I hated having to do this, but I got some help when it came in. They're like, there is a better way to do this. There's a repeatable way. This is simple. This is easy. And if you know the answer, putting this into companies, all the future ones that you do, you can do in a lot easier way. And that's kind of what we've been focused on as well too. So one of the things we'll do for this is we solve this at a top to bottom level. So I'm hoping when you come out of this today, um, I can explain, you'll have a better view of what that means. So two fun things that I learned from this. Uh, number one, I like to say, uh, you're not special. Your cut, like what you build as a company, your product, what you build is very unique and special. If you are a venture startup, you're selling to B2B, your operations are not. CyberSec, if you're getting answers from vendors you're talking to and they say, it depends, well maybe this, you know what, it's the same process and procedures. All of your stuff's still in the cloud. You're talking to the same customers. This is a very repeatable, templatable process and we wanna talk about what that looks like today. The other part, so I like to call it blame it on SOC2. The reason I say this is we could have all the best intentions of the world, but really at the end of the day, you're gonna to have to tell people some of the things you used to like doing, you can't do anymore. Remember that favorite tool you used to use, your personal email, your separate laptop for this? You can't do that anymore. And then what they're gonna do, they're gonna complain to their VP, he's probably gonna complain to the CEO, he's gonna come back to you and he's gonna be like, Cardiff, can I, why, why can't John just do this? And if you're trying to explain why you think that's best practice, it's not gonna work, all you're gonna say, I would love to, but, SOC 2, but it's the auditors <laughs> won't let you. If it were up to me, I'd let you do whatever you want, but like, just SOC 2. And most of them have no idea what that means, so that's your best way to, in a positive way, use that as a tool to drive change management. Uh, so really quickly, and then what I do wanna do is, I do wanna get into very tangible, specific things so you understand this as we're going. Um, so from the context of this, you're, you're a startup company, you're probably selling to B2B. Why do I say this? Uh, Everyone that comes to us that wants help, they're not doing this because 
they're altruistic, they think it's a really good idea. Sure, we all put a little bit of CyberSec in, but if you're in the, you're a startup space, you're moving fast, the number one reason you're doing this is because your customers told you you have to. I'm trying to close a sale, and you know the bank I'm selling to said, you need to pass this diligence questionnaire, and they said, um, and then that's why you're trying to solve this right now. Um, so security diligence impacts your sales cycle. And the reason I like to say this is the number one thing. When we are solving this now, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna repeat it back. We would never ever go up to someone and sell them, I wanna sell you security, I wanna sell you compliance. I'm gonna sell you a top three problem to your CEO. And a very common one looks like this. My biggest partnerships or my biggest value enterprise deals are being blocked by this, or I'm too slow in my sales cycle because I keep getting blocked by this. And now you've got a sales problem, you don't have a compliance problem which means you now have funding to go solve this. They can quantify how big of a problem this is. So what do I want you to get out of this? So I wanna break this down into number one, we've got a five phase process to think about this. So cybersecurity is very vague, so it's very hard to know what do I need to do at the right time and how much of it, so I'm not spending too much money and putting too much time into it. So I've kind of broken it down into what I think are five logical phases that we like to roll it out. As we're going through this, know what matters most, know what right looks like, so if you are talking to vendors or people out there, you've got a little bit of pushback. You're like, I remember hearing that, that doesn't sound right. Why are you making me do these things over here? Um, the other part is like, I wanna give you guys a bit of confidence that if someone had to do this, like you're like, I think I could kick this off a little bit tomorrow. I have some confidence to speak to this. I know what the key parts of it are. Okay, um, really quickly in this, I'm gonna choose my words very carefully because I do not like wishy-washy. Oh, it's great, it's gonna save the world. It's gonna improve the efficiency. Um, very quickly on this though, I look at that there are, there are three aspects to cybersecurity that you want to look at. Number one, how do you represent yourself to the customer? What I mean by that is how are you enabling your sales team? How are you able to respond to the security diligence questionnaires? How do you go through contracting on that? So everything customer facing. More if you're like CISO, Chief Information Security Officer type thing. Second, operations and team. So I like to call this the corporate side. This is all the paperwork stuff that you have to do. This is very, very templatable, but there's a ton of it that you have to do. So everything's in line. The third part of it is your platform, which is really actually based around what does your infrastructure look like? It's mostly on the infrastructure side. The nice part we'll point out is like when we say templates, if you do this a certain way, all of the paperwork is doing, gonna be a lot easier that you have and it's gonna be a lot easier to explain. But just really quickly on this one, because I just wanna make sure these are a little bit more tangible. So when I say faster sales cycles, again, that's our number one reason for this. Security is blocked by sales. You wanna do this faster and easier. Um, when I say competitive advantage, I find this only comes up in a few specific spots. But for example, if you're in HR tech, uh, if you're in something where you have to respond to RFPs, a lot of times they'll say, hey, do you have SOC 2 compliance? Have you passed security diligence? So that becomes in that particular use case. We've had people come to us and say, listen, we don't necessarily need this, but we're getting burned out RFPs because our competitors have it. So that can be, it's more of a niche use case, but I will point that one out. Um, one of the ones that we like, uh, I like frame, the reason I'm putting these up here is I like framing these a little bit more in terms of what do you get as benefits back to the org, not just security and compliance for it. So for example, from the CFO side, if you're a startup and you've got 15, 20 people in there, as early as that, you've probably got 40 plus software tools that you're using. Why? Because everyone goes in, especially engineering, and signs up for whatever they feel like it. You're putting in metrics through a system, you'll probably find out there's five different people using different things. They've got mix panel, they've got hot jar, someone's trying to buy amplitude, someone's done something on their own, there's a fifth guy doing something else. So you find all this wasted time that you have that and wasted cost. So as you're doing this, you're gonna know, hey, by the way, Mr. CFO, I know every tool that we have. As we did this, I had to validate every person that's on there. So you're gonna save on per user cost that you have for it. Um, so you get all those cost control benefits, you know what you're spending money on, you can plan for it better. Free time and focus, the number two, the two top people we find this impacts is gonna be either your CEO or your CTO. because get And usually your CTO gets it dumped on them and they're gonna pull in their lead devs. So your most important people are spending their time on something that they're not experts in. Uh, very quickly on this, these will make more sense as we're going. I'm gonna talk about the last two first. If you have built your environments in a way, which is, um, a, there's a right way to build these with infrastructure as code so they're repeatable, then no one's ever logging in to manually push things between it. Your environments are all the same and consistent. How many times has a sales guy gone, hey, I really wish that I could have a demo environment in there. So I could show this to my customers. This demo environment always works. The devs aren't in there screwing it up. When I go in there, if I demo this to the customer, I want that to work. So if you've set this up properly here, that's a sales benefit you can have from this. We can deploy another environment. 
a lot of times we're finding as people are selling into different regions, they're like, hey, we want local data storage that's gonna be in the EU, but right now we're only deployed in the US, we're only deployed in Canada. Duplicating that infrastructure to have a dev, a staging and prod environment and having them all match in different environments with different monitoring, that's completely different isolation that you have, environments in one region versus environments in multiple regions. It's exponentially more difficult to do. If you've done it this way, it becomes exponentially simpler. So these are like, like the reason I like to describe this is it's very much some, a lot of the things you do here are actually just best practices that if you understand what you're doing and how you do it right, they benefit the org. They're not just a compliance checklist item. So let's, I'm going to get a little bit tangible for some of these. So phase one, I like to call MVP. This is just really, am I doing anything egregiously wrong that should probably be fixed? Right? These are like, am I screwed right now? And if I'm starting to have discussions with customers, I can at least vaguely say, hey, we're doing some security first things. We're working along the best practices. So really quickly on this, um, you only use corporate tools. It needs to be owned by your company, under your company's name, under your company's email, under your company credit cards. No personal stuff, no stuff from other companies, no from your founder using something from his old thing at home. Not an option. No personal emails. I can't tell you the number of times we've gone in and people have signed up with stuff with personal emails. They leave the company. They might not leave the company on good terms. You've lost all your access to this. I've seen people lose databases, production websites, really difficult things to get back. Do not let people do this. And this is, and by the way, why are we doing this now? Blame SOC2. Sorry, it's not my fault. SOC2 said I had to do it. Set up a wiki, get a Confluence, whatever you're using for it, start putting your things in there. You can't document in Google Drive or whatever you're doing there. That's right, just get a wiki in there. This is where all your processing procedures are gonna live. Right, you've got the starting point for it. MFA and SSO, one of the nicest things, if you have like, if you have like G Suite behind the scenes and you can click sign in with Google on all of your tools, guess how many password things you have to worry about. One of the biggest things they have as a requirement, for example, is when you offboard people, within 48 hours, their access is cut off, sorry, within 24 hours, all their access is cut off to everything. Okay, if you just go into G Suite, click a button, then they're cut off in all the tools, perfect. If you didn't know what all your vendor tools are, remember we mentioned that earlier, um, how are you gonna cut off access to people? So many people leave and still have access to your system. That's a horrible thing. So a couple of things, other than just being obviously good for you, these are ones that really matter. And MFA, one of, these are what big ones where like, there's kind of a top five we'll find when you're actually talking to some of your customers. If you don't have this, non-starter. We're not even gonna explore pilot with you. We're not gonna do anything with you. Turn your MFA on your G Suite or whatever you guys are using for it. That's a big one for them. It stops people from getting in, password hacking, all that sort of stuff. Security training. Um, you do this once a year, do it when they start, do it annually, make sure it's audible. It doesn't even really matter. Like, I don't take this the wrong way for it because uh, I recommend best practices for it. But just having something is important. And from the customer side, they really care about this. You just put that in place, it's really simple. It's a big checkbox item. They like to see that. Yes, sir? Five minutes. Left. <laughs> okay. Five and a half. All right, um, we'll move to the cloud infrastructure side. Really key on this one here, you need to separate your environments. They can't all be in there the same account. Split them out, put them in private subnets, encrypt them, do your scans for it. Documentation, there's a couple of key areas. Again, the big thing for this, if you did your environments properly for this, then this is gonna be really easy. So there's about 20 of these. There's a nice like security Bible you can put together. This is really nice because it's good for your customers, but it's good for your auditors as well. You're gonna build out a list for vendors and risk management as well. So this is your nice tracking that you have. This is the biggest one you will get at this point. At stage three, you can have a page out there that says yourcompanyname.com slash security and it talks about your security. You can give this to your sales guys. Your sales guys are never gonna be experts in security, but they can go send that link to people and say, we're security first, go read this. Uh, really quickly, phase four is what I like to call operational rollout. Most things that you've done here, you can get someone to do com almost completely independently from the rest of the org. This is here, okay, now the org has to start doing some things. We're gonna build out a task list. Here's the final gaps that you have. Here's what you need to do monthly, quarterly, and annually. Uh, you put together a working group. This is your leads from all the different departments that you have. You're gonna meet once a quarter. We've got a nice agenda. It takes about 90 minutes. It walks through everything that you need to do. Boom, customers love to see that. Everybody knows about security. HR ops that we have. So there's a bunch of things that you have to do, but like could be background checks, onboarding, offboarding, policy attestation. These are not difficult. You're supposed to be doing this anyway, but this is very helpful. 
Um, and tech ops. So these are like this is continuity, disaster recovery, incident response. Again, these are like, do I have backups? Am I doing vulnerability scans? Am I running high availability? These are all best practices. You probably want to be doing these anyway. If you are doing them, you look really good. Last point I'm gonna talk about here is on SOC 2. So the question I get a lot is, do I need to do a SOC 2? The answer I would say for that generally is, have your customers said that you have to? Just because you do a SOC 2 does not mean you're not gonna to have to fill out a security diligence questionnaire. They still have to do third party management. It doesn't even mean it's gonna be shorter. So figure that question out first. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be following the best practices. It doesn't just means it doesn't necessarily mean that you should prioritize that. Maybe wait till you finish the fundraise and then go kick it off. Really quickly on what this looks like, you probably wanna select your auditor about four to six months in advance. Um, number one, if you're doing, you wanna to start tomorrow. They have a bench, they have to work off of it. Number two, you're probably gonna try and negotiate on things. And if you need it tomorrow, you have no leverage for that. So get that done a little bit ahead of time. Evidence collection is mostly what you're doing on your own time. You're gonna spend two to three months preparing all the 220 or so things that they have in there, screenshots of all of these. So you're gonna spend that time on your own, doing that in the two to three months up to the audit. The audit is actually one week where they come in and they look at your things and they work with you and then one week after just to finish it up, another two weeks to get the report and you're done. Last quick note I wanna write on this because I find a lot of confusion around this. Am I doing a type one or a type two? You may have customers that say, hey, we need to do a SOC 2 type two. You do not. You need to do a type one. Why? Type one means point in time. As of now, I am compliant. There's no way you could do a type two because yesterday you weren't. You weren't doing any of these things. That's why we're building a security program right now. So you do the type one, it's the point in time. Your customers will be pragmatic. They will understand this. You just explain it to them. Hey, we're compliant as of now. This is the date that we're doing it. Annually after this, we will do a type two. You don't need to do it every six months. You don't need to get to it quicker. Um, I've never seen a case, um, you know, like you might have something special in the industry or some customer. I've never seen a case where doing this once every year doesn't cover it. Um, so summary for this, the key takeaways I would have if I'm looking at this highest level, three categories you want to look at. Customer, how you present this. Operations, how you do this internally in the paperwork. Platform, what does your infrastructure look like? Um, there's a nice five phase rollout. Get the MVP out, set up your cloud infrastructure properly, do the documentation. The ops rollouts, so you're getting the teams involved, and you can see if the audit's necessary to SOC 2. Uh, the two pieces that we liked, you're not special. The key takeaway I say for this is, this is templatable, get the help for it. There is a way to do this nice, easy, and smooth, so it's simple on your org and you actually value it, because the bigger you get, the harder it's gonna be. And when you need help doing that, blame SOC 2. Um, and the last one, do I need to do a SOC 2? Tell me, find out if your customers are really, truly pushing for that or not. Do I need to pass a questionnaire or do I need a SOC 2? Other than that, um, very quickly in the how, uh, I'd like to say like the CISO, this is an executive level function. Don't let it roll on your orgs. Don't put a mid-level person to do this. This affects every single one of the org. You saw the scope of what you're doing there. You can't change that from the middle. You need to change it from the top. What question I like to ask is what percent of your budget is allocated to cybersecurity if this is a top three problem for you and it's blocking your sales? If the answer is zero, it probably should be a little bit more than that. Um, use a templated approach. People have done this before. Um, this is not well done in the industry. It's why we do it, because it was really hard to find help for it. So that's why we picked it up as a pain point. There are vendor tools out for this. Um, we do like them. They're nice. They're helpful. What I will say is like the vendor tools, they're good for automation of SOC 2, assuming you've already built the program and you have the answers. They do not build something from scratch. Um, and the last thing, as I mentioned already, get the outside help that you have. That's what we did it. That's what was very helpful for us. Um, and that's everything for today. So we're short on time, so I hope that gives you guys a nice overview. And lastly, we'll, we'll also be uh, in the big hall tomorrow. What we're gonna, today's speech was more about how do we run this internally? How do you set up tomorrow? We're gonna talk about how do you talk to your customer about it? How do you represent that you're a security first company so they trust you and they buy into it and they help you close your sales cycles? Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you.